time for a rant. Hi guys, today's video is a little bit different in that we're going to discuss some of the most common issues in the equestrian world, which, as much as I would love to say otherwise, is far from perfect. Now, I am aware that some of these topics might be a little bit sensitive and that uh, not everybody will be very happy with me pointing them out, but I chose to talk about them anyway because these problems are addressed more and more frequently on equine conferences, scientific papers, social media and also by universities and equine professionals. So before we dig any deeper, uh, I just want to put this huge disclaimer out there that whatever you do with your horse is your decision only. I'm not here to judge anyone, I'm just talking from a perspective of a scientist slash nerd. Uh, who has the best interest of horses in mind. And if there's even a slight chance that my speech will make a positive influence, then I have to absolutely go for it. So now that we are all on the same page, let's get down to our first topic, which is the fact that horses were never meant to carry a rider. Period. For us, it comes so naturally to think that horses belong under the saddle. And for thousands of years, they have carried humans across the globe so we could build up today's society. After all, they've got those long, nice, strong backs for us to sit on, right? But have you ever wondered why? For 55 million years, the horse's back has actually evolved to support the heavy digestive system required for a grazing diet. Add the rider on top of that, and you'll see why so many horses have back problems. I remember hearing this for the first time when I was at uni and my mind was just blown. In that moment, everything made so much more sense. So I'm not telling you this because I want you to stop riding. Hell no! I probably couldn't stop riding even if I wanted to. Like, that feeling just grew to be part of me so much that if I lost it, I wouldn't know who I am anymore. Do you know what I mean? However, I do actually know of a riding school in Russia that requires its students to stop riding for an entire year in order to allow their horses' backs to recover. Afterwards, they are only allowed to ride for no longer than a 15-minute session, which is pretty crazy. The reason I started talking about this topic was because I just wanted to stop for a moment and appreciate what these amazing beings are doing for us and how lucky we are to have them. And also to put things into perspective. So the next time you hear someone say that riding a horse is wrong, just know that they are not completely mental and they've actually got a point. But what they don't know is that a riding can be done without causing any harm to the animal, provided that you do it right. So you don't start doing it too early, you take the time to build up the correct musculature and have the saddle fitted. Moving on, uh, our next issue will be probably the most sensitive and taboo like of all, and it is that not any person should ride any horse. These are some pictures of me riding a skinny pony at one of the riding camps I instructed at about four years ago. It was only for a few rounds and a walk, but thinking back now I am ashamed of myself because I know that that pony didn't have the capacity to carry me. I did ride a few smaller ponies before that, uh, mainly because I read somewhere that Shetland ponies can carry up to 50 kilograms, which is not accurate at all. There's actually research into how much weight a horse can carry, and it suggests that it shouldn't be more than 20% of the horse's body weight. If you don't have the budget to install an expensive livestock scale, you can use this formula instead to calculate your horse's body weight fairly accurately. Don't just simply use a weight tape, as the number you'll get is way off. Trust me, I had to do a project on this in my first year and it's not even close. But anyway, when I say that not any person should ride any horse, I mean a couple of things. And one of them we already talked about and uh, it refers to the height and build of the animal versus that of the person. So if you're a 6 foot tall grown man, you should probably not ride a fragile Arabian, but a well-built mount instead with a higher carrying capacity. And the other thing I meant is the much debated issue of obesity. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong picture of me. I'm all for the no body shaming and loving yourself campaign, um, you know, as long as it doesn't concern a horse's welfare. Even Sue Dyson has spoken up at a conference I attended to raise awareness of the issue. And I was actually really surprised at people's reaction, like how open-minded they were. Uh, and several of them have asked to share their story of how they went on to lose weight so they can ride a horse again. And I was just so genuinely touched and wished that more riders would be so thoughtful. Sadly, you need not look very far to see that's not the case. There's just no justification for this kind of behavior. Again, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with riding horses if you've got a few extra kilos, but then choose a mount that has the strength and fitness to carry you. 
because otherwise your horse's back might suffer permanent damage and be the source of so many problems. Let's put our horses first, we owe them that much. Next we're going to talk about some of the many reasons why long-term stabling is wrong. On so many levels. But let's start with the good news. Fortunately, in most developed countries, the equine industry has recognized the negative impact stabling has on horses and requires its establishments to provide sufficient turnout for the animals. However, the rest of the planet still thinks it's normal to keep horses in stalls all year round and only take them out when they are needed for a ride or other work. But even in the Western world, many horse owners still keep their horses inside for long periods of time purely because of convenience, which is just unacceptable to me. Still not judging anyone. My horse has been living out on the field ever since I got him and he really is so happy out there with his buddies. I personally would never put him in the stall unless he's recovering from an injury or the weather conditions are so severe that leaving him out would put his health at risk. Anything else is not a valid reason to restrict such a large animal to such a small space. And here's why. In the wild, horses roam freely in herds, rarely staying in one place for too long. Standing between four walls day after day, isolated from others, is against their nature and will cause any horse varying levels of anxiety. The stress and boredom will often lead to the development of stereotypies such as creep biting or wind sucking, weaving, stall walking, box kicking, and even self harm. Each of these nasty habits is very hard to get rid of and detrimental to your horse's health in the long run. Stall designs that allow for some sort of social interaction can make a huge difference to your horse's mental health and well being when kept indoors. Similarly, Toys and other forms of enrichment can somewhat reduce your horse's boredom, but they are still not long-term solutions. Another major problem with stabling is that it restricts the normal functioning of your horse's biomechanics. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but basically your horse needs to be moving in order for the blood and lymphatic fluid to circulate efficiently in the lower limb. If your horse can't exercise freely, these fluids will accumulate and cause swelling in the lower leg. People do try to get around this using stable bandages that put pressure on the horse's lower limbs, which slows down the accumulation of fluids. But again, this is not a long-term solution. There's also research into long-term stabling causing degradation of the tendons by veterinarian Seth O'Neill. Uh, I'll link the paper down below so you can check it out yourself. But yeah, all the more reasons to turn out your horse as much as possible. Another major issue is with nutrition. The thing is, in nature and when turned out, Horses spend between 10 and 17 hours a day grazing. Their stomachs are programmed to always have food stuff in them. If food stops passing through the stomach for more than 1 to 2 hours, digestive fluids will cause ulceration of the stomach wall, uh, and the pain and irritation coming from this will be a source of a plethora of problems. So how do we keep a horse's stomach full at all times? Well, there has been a really good experiment on this, which I will link below as well, that compared how soon horses finish eating when given hay on the floor, in a hay net and in a hay feeder. The results show that horses finish earliest when eating from the floor, followed by the hay net and the hay feeder. In the last case, they actually still had food left in the morning, which is incredible! So this is what a hay feeder looks like, and basically you fill up the crate with hay and then attach the grid at the top, which will start descending as the horse eats. This is the best option for extending feeding time, and it's also the most natural position for horses to eat in. But back to the drawbacks of stabling, I know you're sick of it already, but there are a few things I just want to mention quickly. Keeping your horse indoors will also mean that you won't be getting any sunlight to generate vitamin D from, not even if there is a window, as the radiation required for the synthesis to work can penetrate glass, so in lack of that you will have to supplement vitamin D to avoid efficiencies. Another issue could be the lack of fresh air and the presence of dust and noxious gases that could damage your horse's lungs. So make sure your barn has a, either a good airflow or a proper ventilation system. And lastly, it is paramount that you do not keep foals in a stall for too long after birth. They need lots of stimulation in their environment in order to grow and develop healthily. It's especially important that they have access to some hard and challenging substrate to walk on, as this is key for forming strong and resistant bones and hooves. Alright, so this concludes part 1 of this rant and I just hope that I didn't sound too harsh or judgmental. I just really want to get more people thinking about these issues and hopefully make a difference. Thanks so much for sticking with me till the end and watch out for part 2 which should be coming out in about 2 weeks time. If you want to see more of my videos then make sure you subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Right smart guys!